We've already introduced the concept of orbital perturbations and done some preliminary analysis via our study of small perturbations from circular and elliptical orbits. And now we're going to build on top of that work in order to get towards a completely general description of orbital perturbations. Here's a basic roadmap for the approach that we're going to take. And everything is going to stem from this governing equation where we are applying some specific perturbing forces to our two body equations of motion. And we're going to start by looking at numerical solutions of this system and specific strategies to make those numerical solutions both more efficient and more tractable. And we're also going to look at very specific perturbations and in particular third body and nth body gravitational perturbations. And this will introduce NK's method and Cal's method. And then we're going to start actually deriving tools for treating completely generalized forms of F and doing analysis on these specific perturbing forces. And we are also going to look at the case where the specific perturbing forces are conservative, as they are in the case of third and nth body perturbations, which will allow us to express them as gradients of a scalar potential and create equivalent forms of our perturbation analysis that is geared towards the analysis of forces that can be expressed as gradients of a potential. We start with NK's method. And NK's method is the direct integration of the equations of motion, but not of the full equations of motion, but rather the offset of our true orbit from some osculating reference orbit. An osculating orbit is given by the best fit to a perturbed orbit at some point in time. The term osculating comes from the Latin root word osculate, literally meaning to kiss in the sense that the two orbits are just barely touching at the point where you fit the reference orbit. And so the idea is here that you have two separate orbits, much in the way that we had when we did our cohesive wheelchair analysis. You have your ideal two-body orbit, whose position vector at any given time is given by this vector r osculating. And you have your true orbit, whose position in time is given by this orbital radius vector r of t. And the difference between these two vectors is given by the vector delta r of t. NK's method is the direct numerical integration of this delta r t quantity. The idea being that for small deviations from the reference orbit, it is more straightforward to integrate this small quantity and then add it to the r osculating quantity, which can be analytically propagated because it's a description of a pure unforced two-body orbit. So we have our initial conditions at time t naught. Both of these vectors are the same. And so r at t naught and v of t naught are exactly equivalent to their osculating counterparts for t naught being the time when you fit this osculating orbit. And for all future times, you have r of t is equal to r osculating at that time t plus the deviation delta r and the same for the velocity. Just as when we did the cohesive wheelchair analysis, the equations of motion describing the osculating orbit are the pure two-body equations of motion, whereas the equations of motion describing the true orbit are the perturbed version of our equations of motion. In some sense, the Euler-Hill equations can be considered a special or constrained case of this general analysis technique. So what do we do with this? We are going to take this definition of the position vector and we're going to plug it into the differential equation. And we write that is the second derivative of the osculating position vector plus the second derivative of the deviation vector delta r plus the gravitational parameter of the central body divided by the norm cubed of the true position vector in the direction of the true position vector is equal to the specific perturbing force acting on our orbiting body. We are now going to add to both sides of this expression a term of the quantity mu over norm r osculating cubed times r osculating plus delta r. And recall that these two terms together, the second derivative of the osculating position vector plus the gravitational parameter over the norm of that vector cubed in the direction of that vector equals zero, because that is the original equation of motion of our unperturbed two-body system. So these two terms cancel, leaving only a single term of mu over r osculating cubed in the direction of just delta r on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we have the entire term, and we can replace this with just r 
the position vector. So cleaning this up, what we have left is that is the second derivative in time of delta r, that's this term, plus mu over the norm of the oscillating orbital radius vector cubed in the delta r direction, that's this term, is equal to mu over r oscillating norm cubed in the r direction, that's this term, minus mu over norm r in the r direction, that's this term here that we brought over to the right-hand side, and finally, the specific perturbing force F. We are going to rewrite these two terms as the gravitational parameter divided by the norm of the oscillating orbital radius vector cubed times the quantity one minus the norm of the oscillating orbital radius over the true orbital radius, both cubed in the direction of the true orbital radius. And we should point out that by the assumptions that we're making, this quantity is small. Because remember, this whole method is based on the idea that the oscillating orbit remains near the true orbit for some length of time. And you can ensure that this is true by simply refitting the oscillating orbit to the true orbit whenever the deviation between these two vectors becomes too large. So this quantity is a term very near one, and so this whole term is going to be very small. So what can we do with this? Let's take a closer look at this r oscillating orbital radius vector cubed. By the definition of our system, the oscillating orbital radius is the same as the true orbital radius minus the deviation vector delta r. And so this quantity norm cubed is the same as r minus delta r dotted into itself to the 3 halves power. We evaluate this dot product and write r dotted into itself minus two terms of r dotted into delta r plus delta r dotted into itself. We're going to pull out this r dotted into itself term from everywhere, and that allows us to write r dotted into itself times the quantity one plus negative two r dotted into delta r plus delta r dotted into itself over r dot r. The whole thing still to the three halves power. Let's define r scalar to be the norm of r, as we usually do, and this entire expression becomes, that is, we have this term of r scalar squared, coming out of the square root, it just is a term of r cubed, so that's over here, and then what's left is 1 plus delta r dotted into delta r minus 2r over r squared, everything still to the 3 halves power. And we define this fraction as q. So q is a function of r and delta r. So what does this bought us? We can now write that factor in our original expression, one minus r oscillating norm cubed over r norm cubed as one minus one plus q to the 3 halves power. If I take the right-hand side of this equation and multiply it by one plus one plus q to the three halves, divided by one plus one plus q to the three halves, then what I get is negative q times three plus three q plus q squared over one plus quantity one plus q to the three halves power. And I am now going to define this whole quantity as a function negative f of q. So finally, this small term that we isolated in our initial differential equations is equivalent to this new function negative f of q, which equals 1 minus 1 plus q quantity to the 3 halves. This allows us to now write a final set of differential equations for delta r only, where the second derivative of delta r plus mu over the oscillating orbital radius cubed in the delta r direction is equal to negative the gravitational parameter over the oscillating orbital radius cubed times f of q in the r direction plus f. So what has this gained us? Well, what we're trying to buy here is numerical stability 
and the ability to integrate small quantities without having to add or subtract or scale them by very large quantities. And this form of the equations is particularly well suited for that. As long as delta R is small, then these equations are very, very stable and very quickly converge in standard numerical integration techniques. The standard approach is to fit an oscillating orbit, integrate for delta R until delta R becomes large. And the specific definition of large in this context is given by a combination of the numerical precision of the data type and the particular integration method that you're using. And we're going to come back to that a lot when we talk more about numerical integration techniques. But essentially, whenever delta R gets too large for your liking, you simply refit the orbit and choose a new T naught and start all over as shown here. 